tell you a, a story about a guy called Ben Shimoni. This guy uh, lives in the, was in Beersheva. Uh, he was at the party, the, that big party in the Reim where the, there was the big massacre. He he had a car. He, he said to a bunch of folks, get in my car, and he evacuated them out to Beersheva, saved five lives. And then he said, well, I'm going back. And his girlfriend said, you can't, don't go back, don't go back. He went back, evacuated another five uh, uh, people, saved their lives back to Beersheva, went back a third time to the into harm's way. He, he didn't owe anything to anyone. He didn't have to. He's a, he's a citizen. He's not a soldier. He's not even a policeman. On the third time, he took a bullet and died. And I just met his, uh, his mom. This is the highest degree of courage that I've seen. But like Ben, I've seen about a hundred different cases of, of courage that even I, Prime Minister of Israel, uh, and, you know, I fought, I was a commander in, in special forces. I've never seen this degree of courage. In the wake of the devastating Hamas attacks of October 7th, which saw the tragic loss of over 1,200 Israeli lives, mostly civilians, as well as the kidnapping of another 240 people by Hamas, we're joined by a figure central to Israeli politics and international diplomacy, Naftali Bennett. Bennett, born in 1972 in Haifa to American immigrant parents, has been a dynamic figure in Israeli politics. His journey is marked by a transition from a high-achieving soldier in the Israeli Defense Forces elite Sayeret Matkal and Maglan units to a successful tech entrepreneur. Bennett's political ascendancy began as chief of staff for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, followed by his leadership of the Jewish Home Party and then the New Right Party, reflecting his evolving political philosophy. He served in various ministerial roles, including Minister of Economy, Religious Services, and Education, showcasing his versatility and commitment to Israel's development. As the 13th Prime Minister of Israel and later the alternate Prime Minister, Bennett has navigated through tumultuous times, marking his tenure with significant decisions on domestic and international fronts. His approach to leadership, technology, and defense has been influential, making him a key figure in understanding the complexities of the Israel-Hamas conflict and Middle Eastern politics at large. During his time in office, Bennett faced a myriad of challenges and opportunities. He famously formed a unique coalition government, bringing together a diverse array of eight political parties, combining right and left, Jewish and Arab, religious and secular factions. In this episode, we'll dissect the events of October 7th and the ongoing war in an attempt to understand their implications on the future of Israel and the Middle East. We'll discuss ongoing strategies to navigate the conflict, and we'll be shedding light on the intricate dynamics of Middle Eastern politics and the path forward in these tumultuous times. This is more than just an interview. It's an essential dialogue in a time of crisis. Welcome to the Sunday Special. Former Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, thanks so much for joining the show. Really appreciate it. Great to be here, Ben. So you were telling me a little bit earlier before we started uh, that you've had a, a busy day, that you were down south near the near the Gaza Strip. What, what was that like? What's going on down there? Well, I make it my business to go down every two, three days to meet the soldiers, soldiers that just came out of Gaza and are on their way back uh, to meet the communities down in the south because I, I want to have a touch of what's going on. Uh, by and large, uh, IDF is operating very well. I'm uh, I'm impressed. Uh, doing very good uh, and uh, effective uh, tactic uh, advance in, in the northern part of uh, Gaza. Uh, at this moment, still, IDF is uh, primarily operating at the northern half of Gaza that, that's been uh, uh, evacuated uh, of uh, civilians, of Gaza civilians. So about a million Gazans moved southward. Uh, we did that according to uh, international law that we have to evacuate them from harm's way, and uh, we're killing a lot of uh, Hamasniks. At the same time, I'll say the, the you know, bottom line uh, verdict, from my perspective, it's going to take a, a while. This can take months, and uh, because we have to clean up uh, all of Gaza from uh, Hamas. We have to uh, eradicate Hamas uh, totally. Uh, th this is one of the things that I think people need to understand is, is how difficult what Israel is trying to do actually is. It, it's not a situation in which you have uniformed officers of an opposing military who are out in the field attempting to, to fight you. It's a situation in which people are merging into the civilian population, not only hiding on, in tunnels, but I would assume that since there are so many civilians who have been mobilizing 
to the south of Gaza, some of the people who are mobilizing the south, I would imagine, are people who are also attempting to escape the Israeli cordon and move down into the south. And so that does raise the question of what happens once Israel has basically cleaned up the north. Again, it's bereft of population largely. What happens now that you you have to move down to the south? I assume there's going to be a similar population transfer back to the north because it, Egypt has not been opening the Rafah gate. So what exactly happens when you move down to the south? Well, not necessarily to the north, but uh, I assume IDF will arrange some humanitarian um, areas or, or safe havens uh, that we believe are in a good geography, and then we'll take care and isolate a certain part, take care of it, and so on and so forth. Uh, IDF is, is really bending over backward to prevent unnecessary uh, harm to civilians on the other side. It's uh, remarkable to see how much effort Hamas is putting in uh, to increase not only the Israeli uh, death toll, but the Gazan death toll. Uh, they are literally shooting at Gazans that are uh, trying to evacuate. They are preventing uh, Gazan civilians from evacuating for evacuating certain neighborhoods, uh, hospitals, etc. Uh, in, in fact, uh, just yesterday I saw evidence of Hamas uh, terrorists walking with children as human shields. This is a new uh, footage from uh, just yesterday. And and. Uh, in, in an area that the only reason to be there is uh, to fight. So they, they were not evacuating the kids. They were using the kids as human shields. From their understanding, the higher the Gazan death toll, the closer we will be to a ceasefire. Uh, they're wrong, but that's their assessment of, um, you know, Western media and Western pressure. So they're actually trying to pump up the Gazan death toll. I mean, th this is such a major issue, and you've been spending an enormous amount of time talking to media that are largely oriented against Israel, whether you're talking about the United States or you're talking about the BBC. And, and the, the real reason, as you know, you've argued, I've argued the same, that the Hamas Knicks are, are attempting to get as many Gazan civilians killed is because they understand the math. They understand that if they can make Israel out to be uh, a military that's committing war crimes or that's targeting civilians, then they can actually defend Hamas. Hamas knows that, and they're playing directly into the teeth of, of the media, and then providing them with propaganda that suggests that Israel is doing just that. Well, what's amazing is how either gullible or nefarious the media are to, to believe these claims. It, it's truly a frustrating experience. I know for me, it's a frustrating experience watching it and covering it. I can't imagine how it must be for you. Well, in Israel, we're used to it. Uh, it's, it's always been this way. And, uh, you know, not only are we fighting an asymmetric war where one side, being Israel, abides to international uh, law, and the other side, Hamas, is a terror group who explicitly goes out to murder uh, civilians. And then we're told again and again, well, OK, but you guys are not like them. So we expect you to uh, uh, save the, the lives of Gazans. Our, our goal uh, is to defend our own lives first and foremost. And yes, we want to reduce uh, the amount of collateral damage, but there will be. Uh, collateral damage. This is very difficult. We are abiding by international law, uh, fully abiding by international law. Whenever we hit uh, a, a target, there, there's a reason. Uh, we never deliberately shoot at the civilians, but we have to understand that we're, we're facing someone who explicitly wants to raise their own numbers of death. Uh, they are not sensitive to uh, death of their own people. And I'll also say something that might not be very popular. And this is unfortunate. I wish it were not the case. But it turns out that um, not an insignificant portion of the uh, population in Gaza is highly, highly supportive of Hamas and of the atrocities they did. Now, I'm not saying this as a, a reason for us to target civilians. We don't. But it's more complex as, as some want to... Uh, pretend that the Gaza population was uh, hijacked by mean Hamas and we've got this population who is is uh, all just seeking peace. I wish that were the case. It's not.
you know, that point uh, has a lot of relevance for, for all the questions that are being asked prematurely about what happens the day after, because Israel obviously is trying to distinguish between civilians and, and Hamas. Again, that's a very difficult proposition, given the fact that Hamas explicitly does not engage in the rules of war. They're not willing, wearing military uniforms. They're embedding directly among civilians. People slide in and out of membership of Hamas pretty easily. And you saw that even on October 7th, when civilians were literally crossing the border from the Gaza Strip into these towns in the Gaza envelope and participating in the carnage. I mean, there were civilians who were participating in the in the slaughter, in the in the looting, and then going right back into the Gaza Strip. And that makes it very difficult for Israel to even tell sometimes who is the civilian and who is not the civilian. And that, that's a nearly impossible task. But that, by the way, Ben, uh, th that's a very good point that I, I want to elaborate on. Uh, some of the worst atrocities were actually conducted by uh, civilians that came in, Gaza civilians that came in, in in the third wave. The first wave was a wave of uh, what's called Nukba, the Hamas commando. Second wave was a wave of what we call simple soldiers. And the third wave was just an all-out pogrom. Some of the worst atrocities were actually uh, done by these uh, Gaza civilians. Now, you know, the, the the general um opinion in, in Israel has, has shifted dramatically since October 7th because now left and right uh everyone in Israel now realizes something that not everyone realized beforehand that we're dealing with a degree of hatred of uh just poisonous hatred against Jews and against uh, Israelis that is so deeply entrenched in the psyche of the uh, masses in Gaza and of our enemy, we in Israel, uh, again, saying that this very royal we, but uh, many in Israel have been under the impression that if the lives of the Gazans will be good enough and they have a good enough uh, economic future, et cetera, et cetera, gradually this will go away. And it simply is not the case. You know, again, that, that, that has implications for, for the day after. There is a poll. That, there's only one poll that's actually been done uh, in the Gaza Strip and, and the so-called West Bank of, of the Palestinian Arabs who are living there. And what it found is that 75 percent of all Palestinian Arabs supported the October 7th attack. Seventy eight percent wish to see the complete destruction of the state of Israel. Hamas has about a 76 percent approval rating in these areas after October 7th, much, much higher than the Palestinian Authority or any other supposed governing entity. That's leaving aside the fact that the Palestinian Authority itself has been downplaying the atrocities. They claimed just this week that the atrocities that happened at the music festival were actually caused by Israeli helicopter gunships as opposed to Hamas itself. And people, I think, need to understand the nature of that conflict in order so that they can even have a logical conversation about what happens when Israel achieves its goal of fully deposing the power of Hamas. I mean, I assume when you say it's going to take months, I think the reality in the Gaza Strip is it's going to take years because Israel is going to have to embed in the Gaza Strip indefinitely because when you have a population that is thoroughgoingly anti-Semitic, which by polling data, they are, and when that population is is filled with, with people who, if left to their own devices, would start to act on behalf of that ideology again, Israel is going to have to essentially treat the Gaza Strip in much the same way that it has to treat Janine or Nablus or many of the, the places in the West Bank. That's correct. I guess uh, one one good way to view uh, Gaza and Hamas is uh, an analogy to the uh, Nazi regime in Germany. Uh, the Nazi regime enjoyed very widespread uh, support of, of the German population, not everyone, but many, and uh, a sure majority. And then imagine after years of incitement and of brainwashing, uh, they enjoyed very, very broad uh, support. Therefore, the the defeat of Nazi Germany had to be a, a full, um, you know, unconditional surrender. And then there was a process of uh, several years of denazification uh, in order to re-educate the people uh, to, to new values. And, and uh, we're going to have to go through a similar process and it can take uh, quite a few years. It could take easily uh, four, five, six, seven years to to denazify the education system, uh, the media, and 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 see that people begin begin to, uh, if you will, detox themselves from uh, uh, thinking that Jews are pigs and uh, and devils. Because as long as they think that, they're going to continue wanting to kill us. Does Israel have any allies in, in that particular effort? Because it seems like you're seeing pressure 
from particular sources, including uh, apparently the Biden administration, uh, to push for a Palestinian Authority-led negotiation in the West Bank or in the Gaza Strip, which is in, in many ways practically hilarious. I mean, they have effectively no presence in the Gaza Strip as it is because Hamas literally killed everybody who was a member of Fatah back in 2006-2007. So, so it's, it's bringing in a foreign body, and that foreign body also happens to govern a nearly ungovernable area that has similar levels of anti-Semitism in the West Bank. So it's substituting uh, an entity that is not quite Hamas, but certainly is not a traditional civilian-led government that is willing to make peace. If they had been willing to make peace, then they would have in the past when Mahmoud Abbas was literally sitting across the negotiating table from former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert, who offered pretty much the entire thing, and Abbas got up and walked away. Those are the people that the Americans are now apparently counting on, at least in some of their rhetoric, to come in and, and sort of handle the negotiations. And that raises the question of, you know, whether... Israel's going to have to do this alone, single-handedly, or whether a coalition can be built maybe with the Abraham Accord countries, because the one thing that can't be done is to hand this thing back to the UNRWA. I mean, the UNRWA has been a front group for Hamas in the, in the Gaza Strip for a very long time. The schools that are run by the UNRWA are chock-filled with anti-Semitism and hatred for Israel. And, and so Israel is going to have to take a, a much stronger hand in this, the institutions of civil society. It would be nice if they had some allies in that effort who are not already toxic. I think uh, that's exactly right. Um, look, we, on, on critical issues, we're going to insist, uh, because ultimately it's our defense, our security. Um, l let's remind ourselves of, of the basic fact. In 2005, Israel unilaterally evacuated the entire Gaza Strip down back to the 1949 Green Line, to the very last centimeter. We pulled out our soldiers, we pulled out all the Israelis living in communities there, and we handed the entire Gaza Strip over to the Palestinian Authority. Guess who led it? Say Mahmoud Abbas. So we did precisely that. Uh, and keep in mind that back then, the Palestinian Authority was much stronger than it is now. What happened was uh, in 2006, I believe uh, there were elections held, uh, in, in Judea and Samaria and Gaza, the entire uh, Palestinian uh, population. And Hamas enjoyed a full majority. Out of 132 seats in the Palestinian parliament, Hamas uh, got 76. That's an absolute majority. Uh, also, the Gaza representatives uh, had an absolute majority, I believe 10 out of 15 seats. And then about a year following that, uh, Hamas took over in a coup, in a coup d'etat, and just uh, killed a bunch of uh, PA folks. The current Palestinian Authority, when I say PA, that's the Palestinian Authority, is much more feeble, uh, much more corrupt uh, th than it was back then. So, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. We're not going to do the same thing again. <laughs> We're just not going to do it. And... You're right about UNRWA, uh, UNRWA, that, that's the, for our listeners, that's the United Nation organ, which is dedicated to uh, supposedly to helping the Palestinian refugees. In fact, what it's doing is eternalizing the Palestinian refugee problem. But here's the irony. This U United Nations organ is responsible for inciting anti-Semitism in the brain's of a whole generation. So it's as if in 1945, 1946, during the Marshall Plan, we would have uh, handed, the West would have handed the education system back to the Nazis to educate another generation of Nazis. That, that, that would just be stupid. So we're not going to do stupid stuff. Even if our good friends think otherwise, we'll persuade them. But one way or another, we're going to do what's right. However, at the same time, I want to tell you, Ben, we don't want to govern and manage the lives of two million people so it's not as if we want to run their lives no, no israeli has that uh, desire so what we're going to need to do and, and you alluded to this is uh, uh build a structure probably based on abraham uh, accord partners and some form of alliance to to find first stage a technocratic government that can you know run the show take care of uh, uh, of uh, taxes, of uh, energy, of water, of education, of uh, sewage, uh, of, of taking garbage, uh, you know, doing all the basic services uh, uh, any modern state needs. Uh, and we're going to have to do that for a few years until we, if you will, denazify 
Gaza Strip and then figure out a structure which may be a democratic structure, may not be a democratic structure. Um, you know, there's some non-democratic structures in the Middle East that are more successful than the democratic ones. We're going to have to figure out. We don't have to make that decision right now. What I can tell you is that the PA is is the worst candidate to do that. We'll get to more with Prime Minister Naftali Bennett in just one second. First, the world has witnessed heinous attacks by Hamas terrorists against innocent Israeli citizens. This most recent attack was massive and devastating, killing over 1,000 Israeli men, women, children, including babies. Thousands more have been injured, kidnapped, and held hostage. Hamas, a sworn enemy of Israel, will stop at nothing to slaughter every last Jew and claim Israel as their own, and then move on to the West. But there's a beacon of hope amidst the chaos. The International Fellowship of Christians and Jews is on the ground right now, providing critical essentials like food, medicine, and other emergency supplies for vulnerable Jews who need immediate help. But the need is urgent. This great organization needs your help right now. To donate, please go to benforthefellowship.org and give as generously as you can. Write it down. That's benforthefellowship.org. There are people in tremendous need in Israel right now. I know many of them. Many of them are fleeing from the north out of the range of Hezbollah rockets. Many of them have fled from the Gaza envelope. They need your help. Go to benforthefellowship.org. Thank you. So I want to talk in, in order about some of the other threats that Israel is facing on its other borders. And then I sort of want to reverse course, talk about the beginning of the conflict, what led to what led to this failure on the part of the Israeli security establishment, the failure of imagination here, and how Israel sort of internally has changed, what that means for the world. So to talk about the other threats on, on Israel's borders, obviously you have the the threat that, that exists in the West Bank. That is not an insignificant threat, and people are pretending that it is. The reality is that Israel is expending extraordinary resources, actually, in Judea and Samaria, the, the so-called West Bank, up to October 6th. In fact, one of the, the sort of things that led to October 7th was the fact that Israel was so focused on the roiling undercurrent of violence that was happening in Judea and Samaria, knife attacks and gun attacks, and all of that was happening for months. I mean, I visited Israel, obviously, uh, in the in the weeks immediately prior to October 7th. I got home the morning of October of October 6th. And, you know, the, the focus when I was there was on security in the West Bank. The West Bank is a is a very difficult area to govern. It's got it's it's extremely non-unitary. I mean, you have cities that are that are de- that are not linked to each other. Uh, you have places, but but at the same time, you do have a lot of cross traffic, especially around Jerusalem. You have a lot of cross traffic from Palestinian areas to Jewish areas. Uh, no cross traffic from Jewish areas to Palestinian areas because if you drive into those areas, then presumably you'll be killed. There's giant red signs on the side of the road that tell you as much. And so whenever people say it's an apartheid state, Israel, it's like, well, there's only one actual group of people who put up giant, who insist on giant red signs that say if you drive in here, uh, then you might be murdered. But the um, when when it comes to the West Bank, what is Israel's plan there? You mentioned the Palestinian Authority is on its last legs, uh, or at least incredibly weak. Mahmoud Abbas is 88 years old. He it's not as though he in, in his ravagingly charismatic person uh, is is holding things together. He's he's you know widely seen and correctly seen as as an elderly corrupt oligarch, uh, and it's not clear who's going to take over for him. It's not clear if if open conflict breaks out in the West Bank between members of, for example, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, members of what's a smaller group called the Lion's Den. There are a bunch of terrorist groups that are operating in the region, and there is no organized non-terror group that's operating uh, in terms of governance over there. So what is Israel's plan over there? So the plan for Judea and Samaria, a.k.a. the West Bank, uh, is would be similar to the one in Gaza. We ultimately uh, don't want to govern the Palestinians, but at the same time, we want to ensure uh, that we secure Israel. And keep in mind that in Judea and Samaria, there's uh, 550,000 Israelis currently living there uh, and about 2 million uh, Palestinians. But the good news is they live in, in separate areas by, by and large. So we don't have to uh, mix too much uh, between that. We should minimize uh, friction. And we need to ensure that there's a, a stable uh, and uh, competent civilian uh, organ right now look right now the pa is there it is what it is um and and uh, we have to ensure that the pa uh, denazifies itself uh in in two dimensions one is education and and it's really important because this is something that we tend to sort of say it's it sort of bores everyone all right yeah the palestinians in sight it is what it is no it, it's not not now we've learned that incitement actually brings people to uh, dismember babies to burn families to to rape women 
uh, out of uh, uh, nationalistic uh, or religious hatred. And the second thing is the PA currently uh, pays terrorists uh, post-fact. After they've murdered uh, Jews, it pays them uh, basically according to the uh, number of years that you're in jail, which is uh, also according to the number of Jews you've killed. So if you kill more Jews, you get paid more. Now, this sounds really crazy, but it's a reality as we speak. Right now, every month, the uh, terrorists uh, get paid or their families get paid. Uh, and, and that's crazy. That, that's simply crazy because it incentivizes uh, folks to, to go out and uh, kill Jews. And, and it's also a, a measure that, that reflects on the nature and character of the Palestinian Authority. But Ben, if, if I may, I, I want to zoom out one moment because we, we, we sort of uh, zoomed into Gaza Strip and, and, and to Judea and Samaria. But the big picture is indeed a, a bigger picture. Uh, and if I may, uh, this will take one minute to explain. We have uh, an octopus of terror in the Middle East. And right now we're viewing each of its arms individually, but it's actually one octopus. So we need to uh, set aside the microscope and just look at it with a full view. The head of this octopus is in Tehran. It funds, trains, arms, and instructs its arms uh, to hit and uh, shed blood for Israel. Now it's got its uh, tentacles of, of this uh, octopus are manifold. Uh, there's one tentacle, one arm of the octopus is Hezbollah that sits on Israel's northern border in Lebanon. It's got two more arms, uh, Islamic Jihad and Hamas that sit in uh, the Gaza Strip. Just to uh, make a point here, 100% of Hezbollah's military budget comes from Iran. 100% 100% of Palestinian Jihad, uh, Islamic Jihad, comes from Iran. 20% of Hamas funds come from Iran. Then you have the uh, Houthis in uh, Yemen, and you have militias in Iraq and in Syria. And they, they built a very uh, convenient methodology to, to hurt Israel as a representative of the free world in the Middle East. And so Iran, they sit quietly, enjoy life back into Iran the corrupt uh, uh, mullahs, and the, these arms uh, hit us through Lebanon and through Gaza primarily, but also uh, West Bank and others. I've been, uh, since I was a soldier and a commander and later on in security cabinet, this has uh, frustrated me because I felt that we're fighting the wrong war. We're playing to their strategy. They want us to fight the arms and shed blood, and that's what's happening right now. Now, right now, I don't think we have much of a choice, but when I was prime minister, I affected a new doctrine. I called it the octopus doctrine, which said, as far as I can, I want to not fight wars in Lebanon and Gaza, and I want to go to the, hit the head, go for the jugular. And uh, according to foreign sources during my uh, tenure, um, Israel was hitting hard um, targets in Tehran, not only related to the nuclear project. For example, when, when they tried to hit us with uh, UAVs or advanced drones, suddenly a few days after, according to foreign sources, a whole drone base was destroyed on Iranian soil. When they tried to kill Israelis in Turkey and Cyprus, suddenly a, com a commander of their terror unit was assassinated in the, in the heart of Iran. Because I noticed something very interesting. Tehran and Ira Iranians, the Iranian regime is much softer than its arms. Uh, a family in, in Iran, you know you know how many kids they have? Two. Two kids. They, they've modernized, they're soft, and I still believe uh, that this is the right approach Strategically, we should we we have this cold war going on between us, us and Iran, and now we need a, a strategic goal of toppling that regime. I'm saying this explicitly. In the past, I didn't say it. I think all of the energy that we're expending in Gaza and in Lebanon, uh, we'd be better off focusing on the very head and strangling it, and then 
ultimately the the arms would die away uh, for lack of uh, of resources. So let, let's talk about that because I was about to move to the north and talk about Hezbollah. But you're talking about you know going after Iran instead. What capacity would Israel have to have in order to actually take out the regime in Iran? Obviously, both the Trump administration and the Biden administration have been very reluctant to go directly up against Iran, despite the fact that America is a tremendously powerful country militarily. Obviously, the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, is very large. They seem very loyal to the Ayatollahs, uh, which is part of the problem. Is there any prospect of, of rebellion from within the IRGC? Because it seems like in the Middle East, that's really the only way they end up with a regime replacement. It's not as though popular uprisings in these places tend to alone topple the regimes. And we've seen literally hundreds of thousands of Iranians in the streets over the past few years, and that has effectively accomplished very little with regard to changing the nature of the regime in Tehran. So what sort of what sort of forces could be applied against the Iranian regime in order to in order to topple that regime or or replace it? So that's a very good question, Ben. And the the answer is, I view it uh, very similar to the Cold War where of the Middle East, where Israel is is if you will, the America of the Middle East, the free nation, a democracy with a vibrant economy and growing economy. And then you have the Soviet Union, if you will, uh, the the Iranian uh, corrupt, old, out of out of contact with people regime, uh, incompetent, not delivering services, not not being able to deliver water to certain tracts uh, of land in, in uh, Iran. And, and ultimately, if, if you use that analogy, and, and I would, uh, there are ways to accelerate the demise of this uh, very, uh, very rotten regime beyond the fact that ideologically it's horrible. Uh, and I'm talking about many dimensions. I'm talking about covert, overt, uh, ec- economic uh, warfare, uh, diplomatic warfare, and indeed also um, um, what we call um you know, a- actual physical uh, warfare. But I'm not necessarily suggesting that tomorrow we uh, physically attack uh, Iran. There are many ways to enhance and accelerate um, internal uh, uh, unrest. For example, I don't, I don't want to give too many examples, but uh, I'll just go back to uh, open up the, the textbook of what America did to the USSR in the 80s. It empowered uh, solidarity, which was uh, in in Poland. It was uh, underground and and gave them tools to to be much more effective. What if the free world, and this cannot be an Israeli project alone. It needs to be done with, in collaboration, of course, with our biggest ally, America. But what if we empowered uh, internet, uh, communication tools, uh, arms to to the various uh, groups? And next time there's mass demonstrations, they're much more effective. Uh, this time, the Iranian regime just turned off the internet and and internet connections and WhatsApp and Telegram all crashed. But there are ways to solve all of this, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. So my point, Ben, is if we set this and we finally understand that the epicenter of of evil and unrest and terror of this entire region. And beyond that, the, the rest of the world is actually the Islamic Republic of Iran. I think we can work out a, a, a reasonable plan uh, to to make this happen within a reasonable time frame. I, I, I can't put a stopwatch on it. We'll get to more with Prime Minister Naftali Bennett in just one second. First, we all have someone in our lives that it's hard to find the perfect gift for. Maybe they can afford to buy what they need. Maybe they don't like gifts. Maybe you've known them for a long time and you ran out of ideas. But if you are a business owner and you need to grow your team, your perfect gift is simple. You want a smart hiring solution. So look no further than ZipRecruiter. Right now, ZipRecruiter is gifting it to you for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Ben Guest now. You might be asking how ZipRecruiter is even a gift to those who are hiring. ZipRecruiter uses smart matching technology to identify the most qualified people for a wide variety of roles. ZipRecruiter lets top candidates know when they're a great match for your job and encourages them to apply. And the bow on top? If you see a candidate who is a great match for your job, ZipRecruiter makes it easy to send them a personal invite so they are more likely to apply. Get your hiring wrapped up quickly with ZipRecruiter. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within day one. Just go to this exclusive web address right now. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Ben Guest. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash B-E-N-G-U-E-S-T. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. 
it's an interesting approach given the fact that it does look like there is a, a shot clock that's already going with regard to Hezbollah. What I mean by that is that if, if you're Iran and Hezbollah is effectively your forward operating arm, and, and for folks who don't understand, Hezbollah is the, it's effectively a terror group in control of the country. They're, they're in control of Lebanon. They control the, the southern Lebanon border, uh, which is right on, on Israel's northern border. They have about 200,000 rockets that are pointed into the interior of Israel. Tens of thousands of those, maybe up to 50,000, uh, are sophisticated rockets that actually are capable of targeting as opposed to the dumb rockets that, that were uh, being fired from the uh, Hamas-controlled territory in, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, they, they have significant military capabilities. They have a very large uh, army of their own. They're effectively a, a, a military, but again, a, a much larger, more powerful military, actually, than, than Hamas was able to deploy uh, in, in this or any other war. Uh, it, it, let's say that Iran arrives at a nuclear weapon. It seems at that point, then the possibility of Hezbollah getting fully into a war with Israel rise pretty dramatically, because then the idea would be that if Israel fights back too strongly, then Iran would, would threaten to either fire a nuke at, or, or hand off a nuke to, to one of its allied groups. So that means that the clock is sort of going with regard to Hezbollah. And after what just happened with Hamas, how long does Israel have before it either has to take out the Iranian regime, if they can, uh, or take out Hezbollah? Because it, the, the fact is right now, there are 30,000 Jews who have evacuated from the north of Israel and are not living in their homes. That can't last indefinitely. Correct. Um, so I, I think the clock is ticking on the Iranian nuclear uh, program, and I think that's the main point, that, 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 that's the main lever. And you're absolutely right that uh, we can't allow that to happen. They don't have yet uh, nuclear arms, uh, but they've made uh, tremendous progress over the past uh, five years. Uh, and, uh, and I have a sense that I, I would put it this way, I think... Uh, uh, it's not enough to say we won't allow Iran to, to acquire nuclear weapons. Uh, there, there's much more that can be done uh, on the Israeli-Washington uh, uh, alliance to prevent this from happening. Uh, I th and, and to some extent, sometimes it seems it's a sort of lip service saying that, that we're not going to have Iran acquire this, but there's many, many actions that have to happen. Uh, so we ensure that that Iran doesn't acquire a weapon, a nuclear weapon before the demise of its regime. Sort of a, a race between what would happen first. I, I'm not talking about weeks or months, it could be years, but we have to ensure that, that they don't achieve that. It, it would be a disaster, not only vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah and Israel, uh, it would turn the entire Middle East into uh, a nuclear nightmare because everyone would go nuclear uh, and, and they would cite self-defense as a reason. The Saudis would go nuclear, uh, Turkey, uh, Egypt, everyone would go nuclear. And then you've got the craziest region on Earth, the most unstable region on Earth with hundreds of nuclear weapons. So the next 9-11 would be a nuclear 9-11 and it would be in Manhattan or in Boston or in San Francisco. Um, if if there's a lesson learned from 9-11 and October 7th, the combined lesson is uh, these guys will do anything. Uh, so it's not about affecting their motives. It's about preventing them capabilities to, to do harm. So let's talk about the linkage between anti-Westernism and anti-Israel sentiment. So I think the temptation for a lot of people in the West is to say, well, it's happening very far away. It's happening over there. It has nothing to do with us here in the United States or, or in England or in France. Who really cares? You know, sure, the Israelis are good. Sure, Hamas is bad. But the easiest thing to do is sort of wash your hands. What do we care? Blood and treasure. There's, there's no reason for us to sacrifice either one of those. And, you know, Israel is strong enough to, to sort of take care of itself. So what, what's the big deal? How do you answer that question? That's a very good point. And uh, I answered with uh, historic evidence. Uh, we've, he, he, here's the bottom line. The uh, radical Islamic terror innovations, the startups happen in uh, the Middle East, if you will, were the accelerator, but then they go public uh, in Europe and America. Let me illustrate this. Uh, the innovation of uh, hijacking airplanes started in the Middle East in the 70s and hit the rest of the world. Then there was an innovation, uh, another Islamic, uh, radical Islamic innovation of, uh, actually it was Fatah and Hamas in the early 90s of suicide terrorists that blow up, uh, blow themselves up in vehicles, etc. 
So it started here, but it was exported uh, very handily to uh, Manhattan on uh, September 11th. And I was in Manhattan on that day uh, and to London and to Madrid. Uh, and, and then you can go on. Now the new um, startup is it's a new form of uh, terror. I would call it uh, mob terror that evolves into a pogrom, into unblocked uh, uh, slaughter. Uh, th this, I, I, I would almost guarantee this will happen if we don't or we're not allowed to uh, eradicate Hamas. Because what the way it works these days, certainly, is terror it happens in a wave. You, you have the initial startup, then a bit of inspiration, and, and you have your first attack, then second, third, and fourth. After the fourth, you can get into dozens of attacks. So it's sort of like, uh, um, you know, this wave of uh, accelerated pace of, of terror if it succeeds. However, if you nip it in the bud very early, uh, then it doesn't evolve into this wave. That's why anyone uh, watching this that is sitting in uh, Minnesota or Belgium or uh, Florence, for that matter, has a big interest in truncating and severing this wave uh, early on before it, 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 it goes public in the West. Now, in that sense, Israel's doing your job. We're doing your job. We're unfortunate to, to be the neighbors of these uh, uh, lunatic, radical Islamist terrorists. But uh, in many countries in the world, there's uh, considerable uh, Islamic populations that also uh, consist of portions that harbor radical Islamic ideas, not everyone by, by any stretch of imagination, but some of them. And if it succeeds here, you're going to see uh, copycats. So what I would do if I was a leader of any Western country is help Israel win. Certainly not uh, uh, condemn or, or uh, try and uh, bring upon a, a so-called ceasefire, which is really the dumbest thing in the world because we had a ceasefire, they attacked, now we're attacking back and we have to win. And you can't seize the fire before we eradicate Hamas. If the world tries to force us to that and God forbid succeeds, it's coming soon. One of the things that I think this this entire conflict has exposed is an extraordinary level of, of moral gap all over the world. I'm not sure I've ever seen as much moral clarity as you see in this moment when you see people marching hundreds of thousands strong through Western capitals in favor of Hamas. And, and when people are chanting from the river to the sea, what they are chanting is in favor of Hamas, this attempt to sort of distinguish the quote unquote Palestinian cause from Hamas. That's something the protesters themselves don't attempt to do. The protesters never say Hamas needs to be replaced so we can have a two state solution. That is not a thing that any protester I've ever seen has said. Instead, they're making the case that Israel needs to stop killing Hamas so that from the river to the sea can, can eventually be quote unquote liberated. And by liberated, they mean completely dominated by a tyranno Islamic fascist <laughs> regime. It's, it's, it's absolutely insane. Uh, when we talk about moral clarity, I want to talk about it in, in a couple of different contexts. One, I want to talk about it in the context of Israel, where there's a new sort of reawakening of moral clarity. And then I want to talk about it in the West. And then I want to talk about the lack of it in the media. So let's start with, with Israel. So as I mentioned, you know, I've been spending uh, a, a lot of time in Israel for the Jewish holidays recently. Uh, and the, until October 7th, the, the kind of narrative in Israel is that Israel was uniquely divided, fractured. Uh, there was a lot of irresponsible and I think rather disgusting talk about civil war in Israel, which I thought was ridiculous on its face, considering that everybody who's Chiloni, everybody who's secular there has a cousin who is who is uh, Dati Lumi. I mean, it's just it's too small a country. Uh, there was certainly an enormous amount of dislike and enormous amount of, of anger. But the reality is that, again, even people who are secular in Israel celebrate Shabbat and even Dati Lumi, meaning people who are, are Orthodox, who are not Haredi, they're, they're serving the military as well. But that was the, the nature of, of the debate. The debate was all about these internal fractures and was the state going to survive these internal fractures uh, and, and all of this kind of stuff. And then October 7th happens and the entire state comes together in a way that it really has not ever. I mean, the, 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 the last predicate for this might be 48, the War of Independence. Uh, but even there, I think it would be hard to say that, that Israel has come together uh, in the same way that, that it has right now. Uh, as I've been talking about in some of the speeches I've been giving, I mean, whether you're talking about secular Jews who are putting on tzitziot in order to show solidarity, or that you're talking about Haredim who are starting to join the army, 
You know, the, the, the kind of solidarity that, that, that has snapped into place is amazing. I wonder if you want to talk about that solidarity on a social level, that social cohesion, and also the ideological recognition that I think a lot of Israelis uh, were snapped back into, which is that Israel is surrounded by enemies that actually want to slaughter it, and that security is, is the order of, of concern that always has to come first. How does that mindset shift there? Well, I think uh, you've hit the nail on the head. Those are the precise two eureka moments, if you will, for, for the Israeli public. The, the first one, and here I differ a bit uh, in, in in the sense that I, I do think we were heading to a horrible, horrible uh, place. I'm not saying people would shoot each other, but we were we were tearing ourselves apart and and wrongly so. Um, and and because of a, a lack of ability to compromise, and everyone's sure that he's the only one right. Uh, and and uh, here, you know, shame on us. And and in a sense, I I actually think that this uh, year uh, leading up to October seventh, uh, so divided us and so weakened our immune system, our defense systems. Our enemies saw that and attacked. This is clear to me that that uh, um, our attention was diverted from what's important. Uh, we were not focused on on the real things. We were just uh, killing ourselves from within, uh, and and uh, and we know that our enemy was paying close attention, waited for for the weakest moment, and and hit us. Um, so we've awakened from that, and and uh, I, I think it's vital that we don't revert back. To the uh, you know to the polarization we were uh, undergoing before and and it's it's I know right now it seems that we're never going to revert back because we took such a big blow but uh, when I look at historic precedents uh, things do tend to settle back into the uh, good old or bad old uh, you know frames that 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 we're used to and that that would be a disaster we have to transcend it look I myself. Harbor right of center uh, opinions. If if I were living in America, I would be considered a moderate Republican. Okay, those are my personal opinions regarding many things: economy, uh, nation state, etc. But uh, having said that, it's going to be vital to to put together a, a very broad uh, unity government moving forward. Uh, setting aside the disagreements as, as, as long as we can and focusing on restoring security, uh, reviving our economy, and even leaping forward in many ways possible. Uh, the second point that you said is, is also clear. All of us, all of us, right and left, we sort of tended to forget that we're surrounded by, by people who want to dismember our bodies, that want to burn us alive. And it's no longer a cliche. It's no longer uh, a platitude. This is reality. It happened. It happened. Uh, a deliberate, massive uh, slaughter attack. And uh, by the way, uh, shame on us for allowing this to happen. This is, uh, we have to admit the, the reality as it is. It's a massive failure of the state of Israel to have allowed this to happen. This is precisely what Israel was established to prevent, to prevent Jews being slaughtered without protection. But at the same time, and the reason I'm I'm optimistic is that while it's our darkest hour, I have to say, and I didn't know this, it's also our finest hour. The people on ground that I've been meeting, including earlier today down in Kfar Aza and in other uh, kibbutzim fighters, the degree of personal courage and generosity that I've seen is something that I didn't think exists in our generation. I think I, I tend to thought I tend to think that it was, you know, the War of Independence. They were the real heroes. Then the Six Day War. They were the real heroes. I am seeing heroism. For example, just earlier today, I'll tell you a, a story about a guy called Ben Shimoni. This guy uh, lives in the, was in Beersheba. Uh, he was at the party, the, that big party in uh, Reim, where the, there was the big massacre. He he had a car. He, he said to a bunch of folks, get in my car, and he evacuated them out to Beersheba, saved five lives. And then he said, well, I'm going back. And his girlfriend said, you can't, don't go back, don't go back. He went back, 
evacuated another five uh, uh, people, saved their lives back to Beersheba, went back a third time to the into harm's way. He, he didn't owe anything to anyone. He didn't have to. He's a he's a citizen. He's not a soldier. He's not even a policeman. On the third time, he took a bullet and died. And I just met his uh, his mom. This is the highest degree of courage that I've seen. But like Ben, I've seen about a hundred different cases of of courage that even I, Prime Minister of Israel, uh, and you know, I fought. I was a commander in in special forces. I've never seen this degree of courage. Why am I telling you this, Ben? Because it means that we have huge potential to in in this nation. It's an amazing nation of goodwill of generosity, of sacrifice, of toughness, of ingenuity, uh, innovation. We, we we can turn Israel into the most amazing country on earth, uh, and we can. I know it looks crazy to be talking about this right now, but we can, and it's our choice. So that's why I'm, I'm very optimistic, because while we had a, a total failure of, uh, of the institutionalized uh, organs of the country, the government, the et cetera, et cetera. The people have shown amazing, uh, 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 I would say, you know, strength and, and, um, and, and that's why I'm optimistic. We, we, we've got the material to, to, to move forward. Folks, our conversation continues for our daily Wire Plus members right now. If you'd like to hear the full conversation, click that link at the top of the episode description and join us at dailywireplus.com. <laughs>